Our centering thought this morning is from The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare. The quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as gentle rain from heaven. Upon the place beneath it is twice, twice blessed. It blesses him that give and him that takes. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, and whoever you are on your journey in life, we welcome you to this place. I'm Sam King, and I've belonged to this church for over 30 years. I sing in the choir, I'm on the Building and Grounds Committee, I've been on numerous other committees over the years. If you visit, if this is the first time you visit our church, please uh, sign our guest book and pick up a uh, a packet from our usher. After service today, a, a coffee hour will be served across the way in the parish house, and everyone is invited to stay. There's a lot of announcements. Uh, please check them out. They're in your order of service. Uh, and there's a sign up for the lighting of the chalice on the bolt board in the parish house. Let us begin. Oh 
Today I light our chalice for um, all the people in Israel and Palestine and the conflict that's arisen there. Um, my heart breaks for the escalation of the conflict that's been there that's finally bubbled up again to the surface. <clears throat> I also light our green sanctuary candle for all the ways we strive to be a more sustainable congregation, including using soy, soy candles and, um, and printing your words with us on the use of the paper. This morning are by Denise Levertov, a uh, poem titled To Live in the Mercy of God. <clears throat> to lie back under the tallest, oldest trees, how far the stems rise and rise before the ribs of shelter open. To live in the mercy of God, the the complete sentence, too adequate, no, has no give. Awe, not comfort. Stone elbows of stony wood beneath lenient moss bed. And awe, suddenly passing beyond itself. A form of comfort becomes a form of comfort. Becomes the steady air. You glide on arms stretched like wings of flying foxes to hear the multiple silence of trees, the rainy forest depths of their listening. To float upheld as salt water would hold you once you dared to live in the mercy of God, to feel Vibrate, enraptured, waterfall, flinging itself, unbaiting, down and down to clenched fists of rock. Swiftness of plunge, hour after hour, after century. Oh, or ah, uninterrupted voice, many stranded to breathe, spray the smoke of it, arcs, of steel-white foam, glass slides of fugitive jade, barely perceptible, such passion, rage or joy. Thus, not mild, not temperate, God's love for the world, vast, flood of mercy, flung on resistance. I invite you to sing with me hymn number 34, even though I may speak with great, greatest fire, hymn number 34 in the great hymn. Please stand after we sing to you the first, um, after we, yeah, we get to the last line as we play the song through. <laughs> Thank you. 
to talk to you today about compassion and um, kindness and what it, what it means to you to have compassion and kindness. So if you have an example of kindness, a kindness that's been given to you, or compassion that's been given to you, um, you can just speak out and speak loud enough so people who are watching us online can hear you. Anybody have an example of kindness or compassion in their lives? I can start with one of mine. Um, I want to give you one that I didn't want to talk about in my sermon here, but um, <laughs> I, I have uh, often made mistakes in my order of service, or like uh, when I, last week I actually recorded the entire service without any sound, it was in mine. Um, and it wasn't just that, it was not just on the live stream, it was the recordings. So there was no way to recap it, the whole service was, was in mine. And um, Janet Hurwitz, who's the main person who watches our online service, wrote me and said, Oh, I always watch an old service and I'm always happy to see one I've seen before or see one I, sometimes I miss them and I get to see something else and it's just as good. And I thought, 
oh, I don't know, I'm so anxious about making a mistake. She she could find a, a, a you know a golden spot in the middle of my self incrimination. So um, it made me feel better. Anybody else have a kindness that they've experienced? Yes. Well, it's not. I didn't experience it, but I, I, the story is so special to me. My grandson, 17 years old, um, was out with his buddies, and as 17 year olds want to do, they went off into the woods to have a little beer and so on and so forth. My grandson does not drink. He's a proud of his not going to drink and not drink drugs, which I think is wonderful in and of itself. And the cop kind of came by, so they all disappeared from this woods and ended up behind the elementary school where my his sister uh, went to school when she was in elementary school and they continued their farming and so on and so forth. And then it was time to go home, so my grandson being <laughs> having not drunk and he then drove them all home and then he went back to the elementary school and he picked up all the beer cans and bottles and stuff and put them in the trash because he didn't want the elementary kids to come into school and see their property all messed up. <laughs> That's a huge kindness, yeah. And it's consideration too, right? Of, of what someone else is feeling and compassion for what that would be like for the younger children or what kind of example you might be setting for them. That's huge. Anything else? Yes. I guess I'll say that um, I haven't. Mind is getting older and doesn't feel like help, but all of a sudden, I guess he needs help, and his neighbor has taken it upon herself to go into his house and clean it out and give him what he needs. Something that I know I couldn't have done, or, or the community that we've been involved in would not be able to do that. So, as hard as it is for me to see that, I'm really happy that she's. Yeah, but someone can meet. Meet her where she is and help her, help her make that shift into aging. That's a huge compassion. And I think sometimes it's hard to do without judgment or um, uh, without expectation. And I think the, the important thing to remember is that when we're doing something difficult, especially like cleaning someone's house, or even like your grandson, um, when he's out partying with with other kids and he doesn't want to shame them for being adolescents, you know, but he wants to be a part of them and he also wants to take care of his community. And I think I think when we're operating from a place of compassion and love, when we make that when we do a judgmental thing, or I don't want to call it judgmental, but when we do something that's difficult to help someone. We can do it without any shame or any hurt to them. It's really helping and working with them. And, and I think that's the kind of thing that compassion and caring can do when we marry it with action. So I just want you to think about that as we um, go through our service today. I'm going to ask you to enter into a time of prayer or meditation as is your practice. And then begin by breathing in peace. And breathing out love, breathing in peace, and breathing out love. And as we open our breath and pay attention to our breath, I invite you to open your heart with compassion for this world that is suffering compassion for yourself and for your limitations and your, and for your, your fears, compassion for your friends and your family, let's breathe in peace and breathe out love.
Let us be grateful for all the silences in our lives, but with them we need more completely experienced sound. Our first reading is from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, love, abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love.
Our second reading is an excerpt from The Wisdom of No Escape by Pina Chopra. There's a common misunderstanding among all the human beings who have ever been born on this earth that the best way to live is to try to avoid pain and just get comfortable. You can see this even in insects and animals and birds. All of us are the same. A much more interesting, kind, adventurous, and joyful approach to life is to begin to develop our curiosity, not caring whether the object of our inquisitiveness is bitter or sweet. To lead a life that goes beyond pettiness and prejudice and always wanting to make sure that everything turns out on our own terms, to lead a more passionate, full, and delightful life than that, we must realize that we can endure a lot of pain and pleasure for the sake of finding out who we are and what this world is. How we tick, and how our world ticks, how the whole thing just is. If we're, if we're committed to comfort at any cost, as soon as we come up against the least edge of pain, we're going to run. We'll never know what's beyond that particular barrier or wall or fearful thing. I invite you to join with me in singing hymn number 93 to mercy, pity, peace, and love. Hymn number 93 in your great hymn. We, um, we will have to wonder 
what would be the most effective response to illegal immigration, poverty, and injustice in our world today. In recent years, we've heard American leaders recognize that building a border wall was a merciful step intended to nonviolently deter illegal immigration. We have also heard it characterized as tough love, reinforcing our nation's border with clear message, you cannot cross here where it is unsafe to cross. But a wall is a wall, no matter how you spin it. How is today's growing wall in the U.S.-Mexican border any different than the wall that separated East and West Berlin from 1961 to 1989? How is it different from the wall breached by Hamas in the Gaza Strip and its attack in Israel earlier this week? How is it different from the wall standing in China today, erected centuries ago, to keep out others? You might say there is mercy in a wall because it deters immigrants from crossing in unsafe ways, or you might say a border wall offers tough love to those who insist on coming in our country without legal channels. Without genuine compassion, though, for those who are crossing into our borders, a wall is just a wall, walling some people out and walling some people in. It's easy to stand up here and say, love and compassion are always the answer. And it's even more challenging to mandate or legislate love. However, love as an answer is what we want to believe is the truth. Even the children of this church know that when you're dealing with a bully, kindness and love may be the best approach. But they don't always win, even with kindness. Compassion and caring must be the foundation of any human solution involving tough love or mercy if we want lasting change. While I haven't read it anywhere, I, I think rather than doubling down on the no more border wall, Biden, who has proven, proven himself to be a great negotiator, needed to give up something to get more funding for the war in the Ukraine. <coughs> Perhaps this type of quid pro quo quo is what Paul is talking about when he wrote in his letter to the Corinthians, for knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. We muddle along until we find the proper answer. Walls that go up can come down. Sometimes they're taken down by force, by angry mobs, and start wars as is happening this week when Hamas attacked the Israeli border. Walls lead to standoffs that lead to resistance, to violence, and to war. <clears throat> Growing up in New York in the 1980s, we always had trouble with people driving down our road and whacking out mailboxes with a bat or a sledgehammer. I'm not sure why they did it. Mailboxes were just a target. It is a federal offense to destroy a mailbox. But at least, if you, I, actually it is. But we lived in the countryside, and no police was going to stand outside Fountain Road and look for people who were driving down to get mailboxes. My mother became so frustrated with the mailbox batterers, um, and she decided to buy one big mailbox and one little mailbox and fill the big mailbox with concrete and put the little mailbox in it and put it up on a pole. <laughs> and so the next time they came banging they couldn't knock it down. She had to keep reinforcing it. First it was on a wooden post, then it was on a metal post, then it was on a metal post set in a very big metal thing with a in the bottom. But eventually she made it so anyone trying to get rid of our mailbox could not knock it down and could not bang it. 
So they ripped off the doors. And creating more security always creates a more dramatic response. Finally, long after my mother died, someone came down by with a pipe bomb to blew up my parents' mailbox. I've often wondered, and I wondered when I was a child, and I still wonder today, what would have happened if instead of making the mailbox more secure, we just painted on it, hit me with a target, or like giving them permission, maybe they would have stopped. Or if I put a, uh, drew a cartoon, painted a big cartoon face on it, and said, ow, or, um, <laughs> or uh, please, please don't hit me, please. The true answer, though, is always the same. Love is patient and kind. <coughs> Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but it rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never dies. That, to me, is tough love. Hoping all things, believing all things, never being jealous or boastful. Who has never been jealous of a loved one? Or rude to someone we love? I know I have. I could go on, but you get my drift. Wasn't it Shakespeare who said the true course of true love never did run smooth? <laughs> love is complicated, even perhaps most significantly with our families and those we walk beside for the long haul. As the Bible suggests, we try to love our neighbors and tend to them. So long as they're easy to get along with and live similarly. Being kind to those we do not know or recognize, those whose lives appear seemingly different than our own, is much more challenging. Not to mention how difficult it is to love those who are unkind to us or who act out. Tough love then has a second meaning. In Islam, the daily struggle to be good is called the greater jihad. Perhaps the battle for tough love isn't just about forming walls, but it is instead the love that is quite difficult to give. Yesterday at the food pantry, we were very short-staffed because it's a three-day weekend. And several people showed up at different than their appointed times, so either later or earlier. As much as I kept to try tried to keep the staff moving, uh, the clients moving through the line quickly, several got frustrated. And as the trustee on duty, I took the ire for most of the clients. One woman that um, said that I was the worst trustee ever, in not so kind words. I could have yelled back because she was screaming right up in my face, and then her husband came screaming right up in my face. Yet all I could do was offer compassion, partially because I've written the sermon, and partially because, <laughs> <laughs> partially because I've been trying to be more compassionate in my life, even compassionate to myself. And I knew that if I yelled back, or if I, if I got into her, her, I'd feel guilty and bad. I wouldn't like myself for being that way. So all I could do was offer compassion and kindness, and it didn't fix the problem. And the saddest part was she was the next person in line. If she could have held her temper for like five minutes, she could have gone through the pantry, the next person in line, just ate my lunch. But she was so mad, she just had to walk off. But what it did for me was it kept me from feeling guilty or bad about the way I handled it. I knew I did the best I could. I knew we were short-staffed. I knew that I was 
being kind. This tough love requires remembering that sometimes people misbehave because they have their own inner broken places. Carl Rogers, known for his work in humanist psychology, it emphasized the need for unconditional positive regard. Unconditional positive regard for all other people if we want any kind of transformation in a relationship. I think that's what Eileen's, I really think that's what Eileen's grandson was doing, was having unconditional positive regard for his peers. For example, without such regard in a home, or a church, or a school, children may grow up to feel neglected. And they might turn into a frustrated, fault-giving adult. Seeing the children in our parish showered with this unconditional positive regard is heartening. This is an occasional tough love from parents and caring adults in this church makes for a safe and caring environment for us all. I saw this last night at the First Friday event. First Family Friday night is a night where kids from this church and also kids from the community can come for free and hang out. There's a bouncy house, there's games, and have fun while their parents get a little time and respite for themselves. Some think building relationships with children is easy. Throw out a couple of balls and games and things will take care of themselves. And that's partly true, but all who have worked to create strong and healthy relationships with kids know it takes compassion and caring and consistency and persistence and freedom, giving them freedom to be themselves. After all, children, and adults alike tend to feel more comfortable with people they already know and are often nervous or reserved when they meet new people, such as it can take some tough love, loving even though it isn't immediately accessible to create these relationships. So many of you and so many who have come before us are models of this greater jihad power of tough love coming through. As our centering thought from the merchant of Venice imparts mercy and tough love can be just transformative for those in, on the receiving end and for those who are struggling to provide it. Humans naturally tend to feel discomfort whenever ever something alien to our way of life enters our sphere. If we can have compassion and curiosity for others, even people we find difficult will discover new, we will discover new things about ourselves. Growing up is a lifelong process, and it happens every time you step out of your comfort zone and offer care and compassion and curiosity for those people around you. The more you can take down your walls and be honest with yourself and open yourself to others, the more you will flower into the very best self you are. The most transformative thing in any life is the, to be fully understood. Some believe that only God can fully understand them. Others believe that only their closest family members can fully understand them. The truth is that we can only be fully understood by those whom we share ourselves openly with. Only some people will accept that invitation. But that door must be open for anyone to access our true selves. As Emma Children illuminated in our second reading today, if we prioritize our comfort over everything else, we tend to retreat. 
faced with discomfort and build walls instead of pushing beyond temporary boundaries. Living this way prevents us from creating genuine relationships with others and experiencing growth and understanding for ourselves. As Corinthians ended, for our knowledge is imperfect, our prophecy is imperfect, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. It is not just America that is seeing an unprecedented increase on immigration. The climate crisis and fascist political crisis have led to countless neighbors being displaced from their homelands. Even if we build a wall, there will continue to be those who climb over it or go around it or pass through it legally in an attempt to find safety. How will we be more merciful, more loving, more kind in this changing landscape? I awoke last night with the wish that the words at the base of the Statue of Liberty and her likeness were painted on every border door instead of wall. Keep ancient lands your story pomp, cries she with silent lips, lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuse of the teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to be. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Would that those words were not just an aspiration, but a mission for our country, and that the freedom for which our forebearers fought not just for some, but for all people. Wedding compassion to our tough love and mercy requires immense dedication and self-love. However, unconditional positive regard for others has always been the only answer, and it always will be. Let us strive to approach these challenges that mass immigration, climate change, war, and racism present with open hearts, seeking to understand, even as we are understood building doors rather than walls. Let us strive to sprinkle tough love and mercy wedded with our compassion, creating a more peaceful and loving world as we do.
what do we need? Or turning aside from anything that might befall us. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 